At number seven is Polish mathematician, astronomer, physician, jurist, lawyer, and governor Nicholas Copernicus, who with his 1543 publication on the revolution of the heavenly orbs convinced the world that the earth is not the center of the universe, but rather the earth revolves around the sun. Copernicus is said to mark the start of modern science. At number six is German physicist Rudolf Clausius, whose 1865 textbook from Chemical Theory Pete laid out the laws governing the operation of the universe. Every new theory in science published after 1865 has had one of two options. A, either conform to the equations of Clausius, or B, become a defunct pet theory. The great Einstein, who published his first 30 papers on the work of Clausius, has commented that Clausius's textbook is the only theory of universal content least likely to ever be overthrown. At number five, the Scottish mathematical physicist James Maxwell, the founder of electromagnetic theory. As far as thinkers go in science, Maxwell had his hands in a large number of intellectual cookie jars and is considered, according to general opinion, to be the biggest mind in science behind Newton and Einstein. At age three, everything that moved, shone, or made a noise drew the question from Maxwell, what's the go o that? And if he was not satisfied, the follow-up query resulted, but what's the particular go o that? As a youth, he read everything he could get his hands on. Milton and Shakespeare were his favorites. In the years to follow, his childlike curiosity of things would lead him on into solving some of the greatest riddles in science. For example, making the world's first color photograph. As far as equations go, according to Vogt, Maxwell's field equations, which describe all known behaviors of electricity and magnetism in an elegantly exquisite manner, are considered to be the greatest equations of all time, ahead of Euler and Newton. To go through one example to illustrate the density of Maxwell's mind, in 1873, American engineer Willard Gibbs, the founder of chemical thermodynamics, sent out his first paper on the graphical methods in the thermodynamics of fluids to about 200 of the world's leading scientists. Of these scientists, only Maxwell was able to understand Gibbs' exceedingly dense equations and graphical descriptions, and was so captivated by Gibbs' paper that he spent the following entire winter building the three-dimensional plaster surface to represent the various states of existence of water in terms of Cartesian coordinates, thermodynamic properties, based on Gibbs' paper, and sent the plaster cast shown here to Gibbs at Yale as a gift. At number four, we have English physicist Isaac Newton, whose 1686 book, The Principle Established the Equations of Motion, and whose 1718 book, Optics, launched the chemical revolution through his query 31 and his description of affinity chemistry. Newton's personal library consisted of 1,752 books, of which 369 were scientific works, along with subjects of divination, alchemy, myth, occult, philosophy, and those books belonging to the ancients. Coming in at number three is universal genius Italian Leonardo da Vinci, painter, sculptor, architect, musician, scientist, mathematician, engineer, inventor, anatomist, geologist, cartographer, botanist, and writer, whose first memory was that of a kite flying over his cradle. Best known for his great work, Mona Lisa, the most expensive art piece in history, valued at near to $1 billion. Da Vinci is the number two smartest person of all time, according to common opinion. According to the combined independent studies of Cox and Buzan, of the 400 greatest geniuses of all time, Da Vinci comes in at number two. Da Vinci is also one of Nietzsche's seven Ubermen, archetypes to the hypothetical future type of person who will eventually replace God. At number two is the poster boy of genius, the great German-American physicist Albert Einstein, who was born with a mishap in head and learned to talk so late, age three, that his parents feared he was mentally handicapped but soon thereafter began to progress at an accelerated rate, and by age 12 had decided, in his own words, that he was going to devote himself to solving the riddle of the huge world. Einstein became world famous with the publication of his 1912 special theory of relativity, a geometric explanation of light and gravity. It followed from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are food, are but different manifestations of the same thing a somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average man. At number one on this year's all-time smartest person ever list is the great German polymath Johann Goethe, the genius's genius, whose mind was unprecedented, his collected works totaling a 142-volume set, progressively touching on nearly every field. Goethe, on the basis of his youth, 
was scored with an IQ of 225. Goethe's true IQ may, in the history of mankind, have been equaled in a few instances. One may well wonder whether it has ever been exceeded. Goethe, noted chemist, physicist, lawyer, biologist, botanist, anatomist, evolutionist, writer, poet, painter, statesman, and philosopher, was the founder of morphology, the founder of human chemistry, a pioneer following Newton in the study of light and color, the forerunner to Darwin and his evolution theory, the reason Freud went to medical school, and the intellectual mentor to none other than Albert Einstein. Einstein not only kept a bust of Goethe in his study, but for those who visited his 1910 Princeton home, what looms the largest in Einstein's library are the collected works of Goethe in a 36-volume edition and another of 12 volumes, plus two volumes of his optics, the exchange of letters between Goethe and Schiller, and a separate volume of Faust. In the first ever ranking of the world's greatest 300 geniuses, Goethe took first place and was assigned the ceiling IQ of 210. In the second ever ranking of the world's top 100 geniuses, Goethe took second place and was assigned with an IQ of 215. Pastolazzi affixed Goethe with the title The Prince of the Mind. George Eliot considered Goethe the last true polymath to walk the earth. Goethe holds the record for having the world's largest active vocabulary, three times that of Shakespeare. Goethe is the second biggest author, according to World Cat Identities, 2010. In 1850, Goethe was categorized by American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson as one of the six greatest all-time geniuses in history. At age seven, to sugar the pill of grammar, Goethe invented a novel in which members of a family in various parts of the world wrote letters to each other in six different languages and styles. At age 16, Goethe entered the University of Leipzig. At age 19, during his studies of chemist Fraulein von Hitterberg and Paracelsius, Goethe was conducting chemical experiments to reveal the principles that permeate the whole universe. At age 20, Goethe had published his first volume of poems and had studied enough medicine to qualify as a physician. By age 21, he had prepared a PhD dissertation on history. By 22, he prepared and defended 65 theses, received his law degree, and began practicing. By 24, he had written his great tale, Werther, and by 26, he was world famous. In 1780, at age 31, Goethe had worked out the basics of evolution, a theory he called biological metamorphosis, which argued that humans not only evolved from lower animals, but that humans evolved from lower chemicals. In 1785, at age 36, Goethe demonstrated through comparative osteology that humans possess an intermaxillary bone of the upper jaw, as found in other animals, as proof of his evolution theory. At age 47, in his third lecture on anatomy, Goethe gave his first detailed description of affinity. To put Goethe's theories on chemical affinity in context, all three geniuses shown here, as discussed, each with estimated IQs at 225 or above, have each independently arrived at the same theory of human existence using a variation of the same formula, Gota in terms of chemical affinity, Cytus in terms of entropy, and Harada in terms of equilibrium constants. Both Gota and Harada view human interactions as chemical reactions and people specifically as human molecules. Cytus considering the phenomenon in terms of the large-scale dynamics of the universe. At the age of 50, Gota conceived his theory that humans are large types of chemicals whose passions, relationships, choices, and free will are governed by the forces of chemical affinity. And in 1809, at the age of 60, he became the founder of the science of human chemistry. See Chapter 10, Goethe's Affinities, of the 2007 textbook, Human Chemistry. By writing his great book, Elective Affinities. Totally 36 chapters, wherein each chapter is a different type of chemical reaction as found and described in Swedish chemist Torben Bergman's 1775 chemistry textbook, A Dissertation on Elective Attractions. The following, for example, is Bergman's chemical reaction number 20 of 64 reactions in total, showing the decomposition of calcareous heparin by victrolic acid. The modern version is shown adjacent, depicting a reaction between calcium sulfide and sulfuric acid, forming calcium sulfate and a sulfur precipitate. This is what is called a single elective affinity in 18th century terminology, or a single displacement reaction in modern terminology. When vectrolic acid is put into contact with calcareous heparin, it will cause calcium oxide to displace itself from its previously bonded partner, sulfur, to form a new relationship with the vectrolic acid. 
This reaction is diagrammed in simple terms here by way of what is called Jeffrey's first law of affinity, where the symbols A, B, and C can be either chemicals or people. Jeffrey's law states that whenever two substances are united that have a disposition to combine, indicated by the bonding bracket, and a third substance is added that has a greater affinity for one of these, in this case B, the latter two will combine or attract, driving out the former attached species A. The first ever affinity table collectively explaining this logic was made by French chemist Etienne Jeffrey in 1718. Gotha in turn used this combined logic to make his own human chemical affinity table arranged according to the way in which the characters of his novella would react when brought into contact in each chapter. What Gotha did then, ingeniously, was to transfer the logic of chemical reactions over to the explanation of human relationships. Specifically, knowing that humans are large types of reactive chemicals, Gotha used Bergman's 64 chemical reactions and accompanying textbook theory as models for human choice, morality, and relationship interactions. In Gotha's own words, the moral symbols used in the natural sciences are the elective affinities discovered and employed by the great Bergman. In other words, one can explain what is moral or amoral in human existence by study of these types of reactions. At the age of 61, he published his theory of colors, rival to Isaac Newton's theory of colors, to explain light and perception. At the age of 77, Goethe was working out a lot to explain the blue color of the sky, a phenomenon not fully explained until 1871 by John Strutt, and was working to figure out French chemist Claude Berthelot's 1799 theory of split affinities as to how this applied to human relationships, a phenomenon not fully solved until the theory of valence was developed beginning in the 1850s. At the age of 82, the year of his death, Gotha finished the work he is best known for, Faust, the story of a man who is striving to learn everything that can be known and who in fact sells his soul to the devil so to obtain the ultimate in knowledge possession. Gotha's personal library, nearing the end of his Faustian quest for knowledge, totaled over 5,000 books. Ci siamo trasferiti in campagna. Ah, magnifico! Attenzione, Ottone, la D arriva. 